Hi, everyone, and welcome. Good morning to all. I am so excited to be welcoming you to Legal Up, our virtual conference for legal professionals to level up their legal career. Uh, my name is Lindsay Dean, and I am the Director of Marketing for InfoTrack. I am so pleased to be introducing our keynote speaker today, Michael Simanchik. Hi, Mike. Thanks so much for joining. Hi, Lindsay. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming. I'm super excited to be here and to share about the work of the California Innocence Project. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, so this is the beginning session for Legal Up. You'll see lots of incredible sessions over today, none more than right now this morning. Um, but uh, just a, a couple of quick notes that all of our sessions for this whole conference will be recorded. You can watch them in the replay section um, sometime later today after they get a chance to be uploaded there. Um, we have lots of opportunities to ask questions and engage with other attendees and with speakers. So we encourage you to, to chat and connect, share your info if you're looking to, to meet people and um, follow up after the conference um, and, and just get engaged. But with that, I would love to jump into our session with Mike. Um, so again, Mike is the managing attorney for the California Innocence Project, has agreed to kick off our conference today. Um, he's been working with the California Innocence Project since 2012, where he's been involved in freeing 10 innocent people from prison who have collectively served more than 150 years for crimes that they did not commit. Um, so Mike, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, the way we're going to do this is Mike has helped put together uh, a really uh, great and fascinating video to kind of talk about a little bit about the California Innocence Project, highlight one of the incredible stories from um, and a person who was exonerated as part of their program. Um, and at the end, we'll, we'll chat, take a few minutes to chat a little bit more, uh, talk a little bit more about the program and, and Mike's involvement. Right now, new developments in the case of an Oceanside man who was exonerated for a murder that happened in Riverside County. Framed for a murder he didn't commit tonight after roughly 8,000 days locked away in a prison cell, an innocent Oceanside man is finally free. Movie Harris and his nephew, Joaquin Leal, who's pictured on the right there, killed a woman named Terry Cheek in 1998, strangling her and leaving her body near Corona Lake. The United States incarcerates more people per capita than any country in the entire world. And it's not even close. We have, at this moment, more than a million people in the United States locked up in prisons around the country. Conservative estimates suggest that 5% of those people are innocent. Some studies suggest it's as high as 10%. What that means is at this very moment, there's at least 50,000 people sitting in prison for crimes they did not commit. And it could be as high as 100,000. That's two football stadiums full of people sitting behind bars for crimes they did not commit. Think about that for a second. The California Innocence Project is a law school clinical program that seeks to free the wrongly convicted from California's prisons. Since our inception in 1999, we've freed 39 people who have collectively served more than 600 years in prison. In addition to freeing innocent people from prison, we train law students to be better lawyers, and we try to change the criminal legal system so that we avoid wrongful convictions going forward. My name is Michael Simanchik. I'm the managing attorney at the California Innocence Project. Since 1989, 3,299 people have been exonerated in the United States. Collectively, they've served more than 29,000 years for crimes they did not commit. These days, we're actually exonerating people faster than we ever have before. The exoneration rates are getting quicker. We know this is just the tip of the iceberg. I didn't go to law school to do this work. I actually went to law school to prosecute white collar crime. I grew up in Pittsburgh. I grew up Ukrainian Catholic. I'm an Eagle Scout. My idea was I'm gonna go and put all of the white collar criminals in prison. That all changed in 2007. I got to law school in the very first week. I met a guy named Timothy Atkins. He had just gotten out of prison four months before. He had spent my entire life, all 23 years, in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And he told me there are thousands more just like him. That was my recruitment day. That was the day that I decided I'm going to law school to help free other innocent people from prison. The California Innocence Project gets 1,500 requests for assistance every single year. Today, we're going to talk about just one of those cases. 
Today, we're gonna to talk about the Horace Roberts case. Horace Roberts was in the Marines. He was honorably discharged, and he took a job at Quest Diagnostics. There, he managed a team of people, and he was working a successful job, bringing in a lot of income, and raising his three kids with his wife, Deborah. Horace ended up meeting a woman named Terry Cheek. Terry was also an employee at Quest Diagnostics, and Horace was her supervisor. The two of them kicked it off, and they actually started a relationship and were cheating on their spouses. Soon, Terry and Horace decided to move in together, and Terry decided it was time to file for divorce from her husband, Googie Harris. She filed for divorce in December of 1997. Over the next four months, this divorce was quite tumultuous. They fought over the house, custody of their children, they got in shouting matches, and there was broken glass, and there was some fighting. In April of 1998, Terry and Horace were living together in an apartment, but Terry decided that in order to stake a claim in the house through this divorce, the best thing for her to do was actually to reside in the house with her estranged husband. She began staying there during the day, because Horace and Terry worked a night shift, and then she would drive in Horace's truck, pick him up at the apartment, and they'd drive to their night shift work together. On April 14th, 1998, Terry did not show up to pick up Horace to go to work. Horace frantically started calling work. He asked coworkers for them to come out and pick him up, and he denied ever being in a relationship with Terry. Now that denial was intentional because Horace was not allowed to be dating somebody that he was supervising at work. He would have been fired. But those lies set off an alarm bell for law enforcement. Quickly, the police were coming around asking Horace what was his deal with Terry? Why was Terry driving his truck? Where was his truck? For the next three days, Horace was out looking for Terry, but couldn't find her. The night that Terry disappeared, Horace's truck was found on the side of the freeway. The flashers were on, and ultimately the police towed it and put it in an impound yard. Three days later, about a mile away, Terry's body was discovered. Between the lies that Horace told about the relationship, the truck, and ultimately a watch that was found next to Terry's body, Horace became the prime suspect. Over the course of five hours, Horace sat and denied that he ever owned the watch or that he had anything to do with Terry's murder. Despite this, investigators continued to press him and ultimately he said that maybe the watch was his but he had nothing to do with the murder. The following year, that was enough information to get Horace convicted. He spent the next 20 years in prison in 2004, Horace wrote to the California Innocence Project seeking assistance. He claimed he was innocent and he had nothing to do with it. We commenced an investigation and started looking into what happened around the time of Terry's murder. We quickly realized that the family court records, the divorce records, hadn't been pulled by the defense attorney or the prosecution. And we kind of wondered why. Well, the reason was because Terry's estranged husband, Googie Sr., had a solid alibi. He was on camera at a convenience store buying candy with a $100 bill. He then went home and was hanging out with the kids, and they testified to that. So although there was this dispute between Googie and Terry at the time, his solid alibi took him out of the scene, and ultimately, Horace became the prime suspect, and that led to his conviction. So in 2007, we sought additional DNA testing on the watch found at the scene. We had some issues with some labs, but ultimately we got our results in 2011 and we compared the DNA to Googie Sr. At that time we realized that it was close, but it wasn't quite him. We then compared it to Googie Sr.'s son, Terry's stepson, Googie Jr., and we realized that he, in fact, was the owner of the watch. We went to the district attorney's office with the DNA on the watch and presented it to them, but in 2013 they rejected our request to reverse the conviction. Similarly, in 2014, the court also rejected our request to release Horace because the DNA on the watch didn't belong to him. In 2016, we went back to the drawing board and we asked for additional DNA testing. Only this time, we sought to test everything. 
We tested her fingernails, we tested the jeans, we tested her socks, her shoes, and everything that we could that was at the crime scene, looking to see who the perpetrator was. About 10 months later, the results came back. It wasn't Horace. It hit in CODIS, which is the national database, to a person named Joaquin Leal, who was the nephew of Googie Sr. Finally, we had the information we needed. That was a person that nobody had ever heard of. He wasn't in the defense file. He wasn't in the prosecution's file. I threw his name into Facebook and quickly saw that he was related to Googie Sr. We had our guy. We presented this information to the district attorney's office once again in May of 2018. They started an investigation and a few months later they agreed they had lost all confidence in the conviction. And it was in October of 2018 that Horace was finally freed from prison. Just a few days later, the police went out and arrested Gookie Harris Sr. and Joaquin Leal. And several months after that, they arrested Googie Harris Jr. Just last year, Googie Harris Jr. admitted to his participation in the crime in order to take a lighter sentence. Googie Harris Sr. and Joaquin Leal are now sitting in jail awaiting trial where they're going to face the death penalty. So Horace spent from 1998 when he was arrested until October 3rd, 2018 behind bars for a murder that he didn't do. As I said at the beginning, Horace had three kids. He had a set of twins that were seven when he went to prison and he didn't see them the entire time he was in. It wasn't until they were 27 years old that he was finally reunited. And that's because Horace ended up taking all of his retirement income and he gave it to Deborah and he said, go live your life on the East Coast where our families reside so that you can help to raise these kids and make sure that they have a bright future. They weren't able to come back and visit Horace. They weren't able to come and see him for the holidays. They weren't able to come and visit with him and spend any time with him. From the time that Horace went in, cell phones weren't really a thing. Computers were hardly a thing and the internet was still very much in its infancy. Horace got out and had an entirely new world to try to comprehend and understand, just as all of the exonerated people do when they get out of prison after decades behind bars. As I said at the outset, I was recruited to do this work in 2007. Today is your recruitment day. What are you going to do to help us fix this problem? Maybe you can donate some resources to an innocence organization in your area. Maybe you can donate your time volunteer, help review cases. Maybe you're a paralegal and you have the opportunity to go and help put together the legal documents to help free an individual. Maybe you're an investigator who can go and track down witnesses and look for evidence that might need to get DNA tested. Or maybe you work at a legal tech company and you can offer your services like InfoTrack does to help free more innocent people from prison. This is a massive problem and we need all hands on deck. If nothing else, learn about the causes of wrongful conviction and tell your friends because we are the foundation of the criminal legal system. We as jurors have an opportunity and an expectation to make sure that more innocent people aren't going to prison every single year. In the United States there are more than 70 innocence organizations around the country and they could all use support in helping to free the next innocent person. The late Justice Scalia had a case that he said was the reason we needed the death penalty. It was a case he hung his hat on and said, this is why we need to have the death penalty in the United States. Only it turned out that Henry McCollum, the person that Scalia thought deserved the death penalty, was innocent. If you wanna learn more about the California Innocence Project, go to californiainnocenceproject.org. You can also listen to a new podcast put out by Legal Talk Network and InfoTrack that I'm hosting and we cover all of the causes of wrongful convictions. Finally, if you want to hear more from me, I'll be speaking on Friday at 11 o'clock Pacific with exonerated football player Brian Banks, where we'll talk about his case and what led to his wrongful conviction. And at that point, I'd be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you to Ed and InfoTrack, and let's have a good time at this conference. Wow. Uh, such a compelling story and so much good work that you do, um, you and your team, Mike, at the California Innocence Project. Thank you so much for putting that together and sharing that. Um, I got chills the first time I watched it and again the second. So um, 
Yeah, thank you for for sharing that with us. And I have so many questions um, because of just how how much is going into this, even just in the little bit that you've shared. I would love to hear kind of from you um, first, what are some of these common reasons that people have for, for being, why do they get committed, uh, convicted for crimes that they didn't commit? How does that even happen? Sure, great question. So um, yeah, there are many causes. Uh, eyewitness misidentification is a common cause that we see. Um, false confessions appear in about 12% of the cases. Uh, police and, and prosecutorial misconduct or government misconduct is, is actually in greater than 50% of the cases. And a lot of times with that is, is just evidence of innocence that isn't turned over to the other side. Um, so, uh, and then there's, there's junk science uh, where, you know, there's been forensic science practices that we put a lot of belief in and behind and they turned out to just be not valid like bite mark evidence and shaken baby syndrome, to give a couple of examples. For a while, the FBI was testifying about uh, lead bullet analysis, that they could tell that a bullet came from the same pack of bullets, and that was just all nonsense. Uh, mac or, uh, microscopic hair comparison, they'd take hair and look at it under a microscope, and they would say that it had come from the same person based on the, the comparison under a microscope. And again, that was just completely just junk science. So uh, there's a lot of reasons why people go to prison for crimes they didn't commit. Those are just a few. There's, um, you know, I don't think we do a very good job of diving in and looking at, at what happened and un really truly unpacking these wrongful convictions after they happen. We see that in when there's a plane crash, right? We go and we take a look at it and we're like, we got to figure out what happened here so we can avoid it going forward. And we don't really do that well in our wrongful conviction cases. We should have a database of all of the police that are that cause wrongful convictions, if, especially if they're lying. We mm -hmm. should know, you know, if there's common causes with expert witnesses across multiple cases, that should be something that's, you know, communicated around the country. So we can certainly do a lot better. And, you know, that's part of what we're working on is trying to improve the system. But I think it's important for everybody to to take the time to educate themselves and learn more about the causes along the way. And I, I love that the California Innocence Project has that three prong approach where it's it's about um, proving that people who did not commit crimes and are wrongfully incarcerated, that they are innocent. And then it, it, there's two other pieces. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's really where kind of the rest of us can come in more. Yeah, so our three part mission is um, freeing wrongfully convicted from prison, educating law students along the way to be better lawyers, and then trying to improve the criminal legal system to prevent them going forward and make it easier for us to get innocent people out of prison. An interesting thing is California, for those of you that are in California, had the highest, the hardest standard to reverse a wrongful conviction based on new evidence until 2016. Like we had it the hardest. We made it almost impossible to reverse wrongful convictions and there are other states that have problems too. Like Pennsylvania has like a deadline where you have to do your filing within a certain, I think it's one year. And if you, you know, most of the time when we're doing these cases, it takes us a decade to find this new evidence of innocence. So if you're time barred from presenting your case, innocent people are gonna languish in prison forever. So there's, there's certainly a lot of additional reform we can do. And then, you know, I think one of the, best things about having a, a clinical program is that we can make sure that the lawyers that we're putting out into the, into the field know about these things. So some of our best students have been prosecutors that have landed in some prosecutor's offices that know about wrongful convictions mm -hmm. and then can watch out and know the causes and, and be aware that, you know, if there is such a case coming in, in front of them, they'll do something about it. Right, because how much better to not put the person in prison incorrectly in the first place than have right. to go and reverse it later. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you mentioned that some of these cases takes years and years. I think you've said more than 10 years in some in many cases, in most cases. Is that the last I checked uh, the average time that a, an exonerate person had sat in prison before their their case was reversed was 16 and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, and and a lot of that is is because it takes us the time to find the evidence of innocence, whether it's like we have to track down the biological material or we can't get access to police reports or we're tracking down witnesses that that, you know, have gone uh, you know missing or have moved around. So uh, it, it's there's a variety of factors, 
But I think a lot of that can be sped up if, if innocence organizations have more resources. We can certainly move quicker if we have more people on the ground doing this work. Right, because you only have so many people to do all that legwork. And if you're spreading it out across multiple individuals as you're waiting for a follow-up, I can imagine that would be incredibly exactly. time-consuming. How, how do you and your team and the uh, law students you work with kind of stay committed? It's got to be really demoralizing after time after time could bring this evidence before um, before the state and, and ask for, for it to be revisited, only to be told no again and again. How are you... How is your approach to keep coming back again and not just give up? It's incredible. Yeah, and, and Horace's case is one of those cases where it's like every time you go and then you get beat down again, but it's, yeah. you know, going and having a, a sit down with him and talking with him and, you know, it really just lights a fire under you that like this guy, we you know, just talking to him and seeing the evidence and seeing the, the divorce records, I knew he didn't do it. He was 26 miles south. He was an hour away. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, from the crime scene, like there was no way if he were to have run his trucks at the scene, you know, I'm like, you know, there's no way this guy did it. I've got to do whatever I can to figure out what happened here. Um, and really what it all comes down to is those moments when they walk out of prison, mm -hmm. you kind of live for that next moment when you walk somebody out. And, and Horace was just, you know, he, he got, we weren't allowed to be, the students weren't allowed to be close to the, to the uh, prison walls Mm -hmm. uh, but he, he got pulled up to this, to the fence and the gates kind of open and they, they sort of part ways. Right. And he gets out of this van, they drove him up to the, to the wall and he just basically falls into my arms out of the prison and he's just sobbing. And we, we took like 10 minutes together, just sobbing. Um, this 20 year nightmare is finally over for him. Yeah. And it's those moments right there where you realize like, this is a person's life. This is somebody's you know, two decades. He missed his entire you know, 20 years of raising his kids. Um, it's, it's that right there that kind of makes you wake up in the morning and go, I got to get to work on the next one. There's, there's more Tim Atkins. There's more Horace Roberts out there. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times it's, a, it's like right now, there's a letter sitting in our office of an innocent person. So we got to figure out that. It's almost daunting in the enormity of it. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, even just hearing it now. So definitely. Um, so you touched on it a little bit, but it, if if you had to kind of tie in the very, very large question of how to fix the system, you talked about the databases. You talked about, um, you know, in, informing people in prosecutors' office and, and in general. And you mentioned on the video how important it is for for those of us who might be on a jury one day to be aware of. Um, all the things that could be missing in a case. What is, how do we, how do we, like, I think I, what everybody would imagine is wondering, like, how else can we fix it? What can we do about it? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it starts with education and awareness for everybody. And I, I and I think we've done a, f a fairly decent job over the last decade of kind of spreading the news about what what's happening. Uh, for the longest time, for the last hundred years, this country has, has chosen finality in convictions mm -hmm. over the truth. And I think we're starting to see a shift across the United States where we're now seeking the truth. And that's a crazy thing to think about. But, you know, 100 years ago, we thought, like, let's let the jury's decision stand unless there's absolutely something super compelling. And now we're like, well, you know, we people, we're humans, we make mistakes. And do we really want to make it that hard if, if the truth is right there in front of us? Why can't we present the truth? So federal courts are still in a situation where you can't do DNA testing on a case. You actually have to do your DNA testing in state court. Federal courts are pretty much off limits. And that started in 1994. And we haven't seen much movement there at all. Um, that would take Congress uh, changing some laws to allow us to present our, our wrongful convictions in, in the federal courts, unless you have a federal constitutional claim, which doesn't always exist in all of these cases. So um, certainly we can do a lot more um, to make it easier for us to present these cases. And then we can also just do a lot more just to understand how these things have happened. Yeah. It sounds almost like something, just a policy that hasn't gotten updated yet to mm -hmm. kind of reflect the science, uh, as you pointed out, which is is 
you know, mind boggling that that's the reason that you can't prove innocence for some of these folks. Yeah. I mean, there, there's not like a, you can't just go into, into, uh, into, into federal court and say, this person's innocent. Here's the evidence. In fact, Scalia says, Justice Scalia had, has had said in, in almost every opinion, look, we don't have a constitutional right when you're just claiming innocence. He would choose. He would choose to uphold a conviction if there's no federal constitutional right violated, despite evidence of innocence. Which is like a, that's a wild thing. Yeah, there's not many places to your. I can't. I keep thinking about what you said about. And there's a plane crash. It's not like who, who, whichever side argues the best about what could have happened. It, it's no. What actually did happen? And and in the criminal justice system, it's it's it, it's that. It's which side is more compelling, not which side is actually proving the truth. So that's yeah, um, quite the different scenario from in most other places that we encounter. Right. Right. Um. Well, uh, I think how can those of us watching again, you, you mentioned in your video, but I would just love to give, for you to give us another kind of glimpse into what, what resources, what actions we can take and what the innocence project means, what the California innocence project, you mentioned there's, there's organizations all across the country. What, what, what resources do you need? What can you, what can people who are attending here or watching this recording um, take action on? Yeah. I mean, you bring, you bring up a great point. So there are, more than 70 innocence organizations in the United States. And we're all organized under what's called the Innocence Network. So if you go to innocencenetwork.org, you can find your local innocence organization. And we're all independent of one another. So if there's an innocence organization in, in your area, I highly suggest that you get in touch and offer whatever you can to them, whether it's resources like donations, or you can buy gear from them. We sell mm -hmm. a lot of gear on our website. Uh, you can offer, if you're a lawyer, I know there's, you know, pro bono opportunities at most of the innocence organizations. If you're an investigator, we're always looking for investigators to volunteer to go and help us find witnesses or to track down physical evidence that we might do DNA testing in. Mm -hmm. If you're a paralegal, gosh, I would love to not have to format my briefs. If somebody could <laughs> offer to help me do that, that would be fantastic. Uh, I, you know, I think Every innocence organization kind of has a different model for how they incorporate volunteers into their work. Mm -hmm. But uh, I highly suggest you look up your local one and find out where you can fit in. That's great. That helps a lot, especially since I know we have people watching from all over the country. So it's great to know that there's a, a one place we can go to then connect with more local organizations. Um, and then, okay, so as a, as a kind of a final, final question, you mentioned earlier that today is a fairly notable day in your world. And I would love to, for you to share with everyone kind of what, what the rest of your day is going to look like after you, you end this very early call for you. Sure. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, California is one of the hardest places to reverse convictions with new evidence. And so in 2013, uh, knowing that the bar was so high that we would never get back into court on many of these cases, we picked out 12 cases where we had strong evidence of innocence, but yet the system had failed. We had presented these cases. The court said no. The prosecution said no. And these people continued to be stuck in prison. And we drafted clemency petitions for all 12 of them. And we walked from San Diego to Sacramento and we delivered them to Governor Brown. It was 712 miles and it took 50 days, but it started April 27th. 2013. So today is the 10 year anniversary. And I'm happy to report that since then, 11 of the 12 have actually gone home. So, um, wow. and that that's, they're all, each and every case is a bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, but a, a big part of that has been our ability to go out and change the system to make it easier to get innocent people home. And uh, so we'll be walking set just a short seven miles, not a, not a 20 mile day or anything crazy like that. But uh, yeah, this, later this morning, I'll be doing a, a short uh, 10 year commemoration uh, for the Innocence March. Oh, I love that. And that's that's taking place down in, in San Diego. Is that correct? Is that where you're at now? Yeah. So if you see us on the side of the road, give us a honk or something. Yeah. Honk, wave. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, well, that's incredible. So uh, thank you for joining us so early then also knowing you're going to go on a seven mile walk later today. Um, very cool that we're kind of aligning with that anniversary too. Um, I love that. Yeah. 
I we're at time now and I want to be respectful of your day and everyone else's. Um, thank you so much. I can't thank you enough. It was so great to hear your story, the stories of some of the people you work with. Um, and then also if anyone watching wants to hear more of um, more about the folks that Mike and the California Innocence Project work to free, work to prove that they are wrongfully incarcerated, we have an amazing uh, chance tomorrow, Friday at 1130 or 11, sorry, 11 Pacific. Um, where Mike's actually going to sit down with one of the people that the California Innocence Project helped, helped to prove innocence for um, and just talk about his story and, and how that all came together. Um, it'll be a great chance to actually ask Mike and uh, Brian Banks questions at that point, since I've hogged all the time asking my own questions today. Um, so please come tomorrow if you can. Um, and uh, hopefully you enjoy the rest of the conference with all the other sessions that are ongoing. Um, and yeah, Mike, thank you so much for your time. Really yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for it. having me. It's been great. Awesome. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Have fun on your walk. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.